On September 17, 1939, poor Poland was done for. After a German attack, the Soviet Union joined the fray from the other side. But in our previous video, an alternate reality was presented where the modern Polish military was sent through time to replace the old Polish army. And the new Poles stopped the Germans in their tracks. But now, would the exhausted Polish defenses, badly outnumbered, still survive the Soviet onslaught as well? Modern-day military can be so effective because of computing power. Luckily, in 1939 there would be no way to mess with the computers. But in 2020, protecting computers from viruses is crucial. The sponsor of this video, Total AV, has a special offer for you. And a warning. Various spyware and phishing software may quietly gather important information about you. They can hijack your accounts or even steal your credit card data. And ransomware can lock up your computer or smartphone until you pay up. Did you know that each year one in three Americans get affected by online attacks? Mac users are also experiencing increases in viruses. Total AV can help protect your device in real time. They're giving Binko viewers a special offer, $29.99 for one year of Total AV Pro subscription and a VPN on top of that for free on three different devices. That's exceptional value, so click the link below the video and give Total AV a try. On September 17th, the original war timelines saw the Soviet Union join the Germans and attack Poland from the east. Now, the very fact that the Poles managed to defend from the Germans could influence the Soviet decision to enter the war. The Soviets might not attack at all, or the Germans might persuade the Soviets to attack earlier. But all that is impossible to know, so let's just assume the original deal stays and the Soviets do attack on the 17th. Their attack was considerable. The thing is, in the real timeline they came in when the Polish forces were already near the breaking point. So they basically mopped up the Poles and just walked in, taking huge chunks of Polish territory. The Germans fell back to a pre-arranged line and both sides then split the Polish territory in two. The Soviets attacked with fewer soldiers than the Germans, but had more equipment ready. Of course, some of their planes, tanks and such were pretty outdated, even for 1939. The Poles would not likely meet the Soviets on the original borders, as they would lack numbers, especially when the German threat would still exist in the West, even though by September 17th it's likely a million men might be mobilized. Sadly for the Poles, most of them would lack even assault rifles and would likely be using captured German rifles, hunting rifles or even just handguns. Mobilizing them earlier to fight against the initial German invasion would likely not be possible, as the old reservist system magically disappeared overnight alongside the old weapons. So something like 90% of the Polish infantry by then would be from the part of the 1939 population which lacked experience. But one can't just give them a rifle and send them to a battle. Perhaps by giving each platoon a core of experienced soldiers as leaders, such units might be able to hold together and hold an area where there is no large-scale enemy offensive planned. 2020 reservists would help them, as well as the Territorial Army, which is made up mostly of volunteers, led by retired professional soldiers, now serving in a part-time role. Sort of like the US National Guard. The Territorial Army troops went through a 16-day basic training and most of them had another several days to several weeks of additional training accumulated over the last few years. There are light infantry without heavy firepower. That's perhaps another 50,000 troops and 50,000 more of the professional active duty troops. But a lot of those would have already suffered casualties in battles against Germany. The Eastern Front would not be as big as the Western one. Even the Soviets did not attack through the huge Pripyat marshes. Instead, the army groups from Belarusian and Ukrainian territory pinched Poland from two directions. The modern Poles in the northeast would likely fall back to the same lines the Soviets managed to get to by September 20th anyway. One crucial area would be the southern region around the city of Borislav. Oil wells there accounted for 70% of Polish oil production. Nearby refineries would also be a major item that would need protection. So in the south, the Poles would likely make a stand a bit closer to the Soviet starting positions. That way, between Lithuania in the north, the marshes in the middle and Romania in the south, they would have to defend some 220 miles of the front line. Lithuania did get basically invaded by the Soviet Union, but that happened in the spring of 1940. And Hungary and Romania did not actively help the Germans in the war until after Germany seemed invincible, after it defeated France. 
Interestingly, after Germany occupied Czechoslovakia in 1938, a puppet state of Slovakia emerged, which helped against Poland a year later. But given their fairly small numbers, they were inconsequential, and they would equally make no difference in the fight against modern Poland. While exact numbers of tanks by variants are hard to assess, orders of battles for the Soviets do exist. With the known inventory of each unit type, something like 2200 medium and heavy tanks and nearly 2500 light tanks is a plausible figure. Soviet tanks were mostly BT series light 2 medium tanks and light T26 tanks, with several hundred of the heavier multi turreted tanks. The big issue for the Soviets would be the fact that most of their tanks did not use radio. In fact, their doctrine back then was to use tanks mostly as infantry support, and a relatively small number of units where tanks were supposed to break through on their own. With little communication and poor sensors for the Soviets, the Poles would likely be able to stop those armored formations after several days of intense fighting. It's actually the plentiful Russian cavalry divisions that might fare better, as they would be fairly mobile and numerous enough to withstand a lot of individual losses and the Poles would be quite worse off in the air. They would be down to perhaps a few hundred air-to-air -air missiles, if they were wise enough to save some, and their overall force would likely lose a dozen planes due to accidents and German attacks on air bases that managed to get through. Non-stop tempo of air ops would also likely preclude a sizable part of the remaining fleet, possibly up to half, of being available at any one time. Longer range surface to air systems would also be spent by then, so basically it would be perhaps two or three dozen planes sent against masses of Soviet aircraft. While the original Poland could operate planes from grass airfields, modern Poland would lack even the modern road network to move their planes to and operate from those roads. Protecting those air bases, less than a dozen of them against fresh hordes of Soviet aircraft, would thus become a priority. The fact that the Germans would also likely occasionally prod from the west would not help either. Poland would likely use everything it's got, including the old Iskra jet trainers and even turboprop trainers. But those would likely not get much done without casualties, as they lack sensors, speed and decent weapons. Perhaps all the Polish planes would better be used as interceptors at that point rather than as ground support, even if they had to resort to attacks with guns. The Poles would also have spent most of their guided bombs by the time the Soviets attack. Their air force, what's left of it, would have to resort to using much less precise unguided bombs. Flying low to deliver them in more precise manner would be out of the question, as that would risk losing those fighters. The Soviets would likely control a lot of the air, and certain attack runs, both from the east and from the west, would get through. Munitions production as well as oil production would be impacted and both of those would be quite crucial for Poland. Eventually, the modern ammo would start running out. While the 1939 Polish arms industry would be able to step in and model some replacement rounds after modern round dimensions, those rounds would still be basically 1939 technology. The only upside would be that they would be aimed by decades newer aiming systems, so Polish vehicles would still be destroying a dozen Soviet vehicles before needing to retreat. Of course, at some places, like near the oil fields in the southeast, retreat would not be an option. Polish forces would at some point fall back on old Cold War weapon stocks, like rocket-propelled grenades, once the guided missiles run out. Fairly simple weapons like those could perhaps even be reverse-engineered, copied and produced in further quantities. Out of tens of thousands of people from the future, perhaps some engineers and chemists might be helpful. Getting the rocket motor right might still prove troublesome and take months. The Soviet air forces sent to Poland would never be fully destroyed. After a few months of constant fighting, the Polish air force would have trouble keeping most of their planes in the air. To make things worse, both Germany and the Soviets did have more forces which they initially held back. Now those might get thrown back in the grinder. Also, both the USSR and Germany still had their production facilities and could replace their equipment. The Poles would likely still inflict huge losses to the Soviets, obliterating their frontline vehicles and even a lot of cavalry eventually. But the Soviet artillery being held back might fare better than the German artillery earlier, as the Poles would be lacking in air power and even the Polish artillery might be lacking efficient rounds. However successful at initially blocking attacks, the Polish defense lines would start falling apart under constant pressure from two sides. They would simply be running out of ammo and fuel. 
In 1937, there were just 6,000 various trucks in the entire country of Poland. Planners back then thought a quarter of that number could be mobilized for the army. Compare those figures with the numbers of trucks that today's Polish army uses. And fuel consumption is much higher for larger modern trucks. Going on offensives would be out of the question, as that would require way too much fuel and would expose Poles to further attacks. A lone tank, without other support, would still be vulnerable if going on attack or remaining on position when it's getting outflanked from all sides. Sooner or later, it would get shot at from the back by multiple units and likely neutralized. While not crucial, the naval arena deserves to be mentioned. The Soviets did not attack with a naval force. Germany had a naval force mostly on station but was fairly unimportant, but the modern Polish navy would be quite capable of wreaking some havoc in the Baltic Sea. Poland in 1939 had access to the sea only near Gdynia, via a narrow patch of land, and one that modern Poland might give away if it decides it's too hard to defend it, with the Germans being so close on two fronts. If that happens, that also means that the Polish navy ships would basically have to set off into the Baltic Sea and harass the Germans, praying they don't run out of supplies before the Polish counterattacks free a port up north. Helicopters could, though, try to resupply the ships with the essentials, flying over German territory. The modern sensors and weaponry of those ships, including Harpoon and RBS-15 anti-ship missiles, would mean the German fleet would quickly learn to stay away. But it's unlikely the Poles would go far away from Poland, after the German fleet. They would be more likely to enjoy the protection of their air force and stick fairly close to the shore trying to defend themselves against German submarines and shell the East Prussian coastline. The Polish Navy has three submarines of their own, which outclass any German subs considerably, but they would be next to impossible to resupply. When they run out of torpedoes, they would be mostly useless. And just like with the ships, it would be unlikely that all of the subs would be maintained enough to be ready for service by the start of the war. And just like in the real timeline, the Germans would be unlikely to send most of their navy in the Baltic, as they feared the Allied naval response to the invasion of Poland, so most of their navy was tied up elsewhere. Eventually, if no outside interference would happen, Poland would still lose. But it would take half a year or more instead of a month, and they would take with them a good part of German heavy equipment, tanks, artillery and planes, as well as a sizable chunk of the Soviet total forces. It wouldn't be out of the question that the Soviets would lose more troops in Poland than they did against Finland the Germans too would likely have many times higher casualties than they really had in Poland. The weapon stocks would get slowly replenished for Germany and the USSR, but the impact would still be grave. Germany would likely have to postpone their attack on France by months, if not half a year. Which also means additional months for the Allies to mobilize and position, which were desperately needed in the real timeline. And while the losses of tanks in Poland, most of them being older types, would be a big but not crucial loss, the Luftwaffe losses, including most of the Stukas and a lot of quality fighters, bombers and their pilots, might prove to be detrimental to the German campaign in the West. In theory, it might be the French and the British who'd first attack Germany instead. The Soviets would also have to postpone their attack on Finland by months. In a way, a proper early war might even give them an edge in experience over the Finns. Overall, it is likely the butterfly effect of this alternate history invasion of Poland would be so severe that Germany might not even fully win over France. A stalemate, similar to the one in the World War I, might completely change history. Not just stopping Germany far earlier, but influencing the relationship between Germany and Russia. Operation Barbarossa might never happen. Even the Japanese attack on the US might not be pondered, with the US being more free to act against Japan. And the dynamics of the Cold War from the 1950s onward might be completely different if the Soviet Union never had to experience that excruciating war. The USSR might have many more people left alive, but at the same time its industrial and technological revolution might not have proceeded at the same pace. And a similar issue might apply to other countries, including the US, which might not become the superpower that it is as early as it did. So who knows what our world would look like today. Oh, and before you go, think about subscribing if you like my content. If you want to be notified of my upcoming videos, subscribing is not enough. You also have to click that bell-shaped notification icon. And if you're viewing Binkov on a phone, notifications from YouTube also need to be turned on. Well, that's it for now. Salutations!
And remember, Binkov may talk about hypothetical wars, but only real peace can bring us all together.